Hello, fellow preppers, survivalists, and concerned citizens across the United States. I'm here today with a message of urgency, a call to action that you cannot afford to ignore. Think about this for a moment. Are you truly prepared for what's coming? The scenarios we feared, the situations we've planned for. What if I told you that they're closer than we thought? I have information, critical insights that I must share with you, my American brothers and sisters. It's time to brace ourselves because what they have in store for us, it's beyond what many of us have anticipated. In these uncertain times, have you noticed how spending habits are changing dramatically across the United States? Despite the looming shadow of economic instability, there's a surprising trend emerging. Doom spending. It's as if collectively we're throwing caution to the wind, embracing a spend now worry later philosophy. But why is this happening? Consider the state of our economy. Nearly every American is concerned, yet paradoxically, many continue to spend more while saving less. It's a phenomenon that defies logic at first glance, but delve deeper, and it reveals a startling coping mechanism. Faced with relentless economic fears, people are choosing to ignore the harsh realities, spending as if there's no tomorrow. It's a form of escapism, isn't it? A way to momentarily forget the financial pressures bearing down on us. But what does this mean for our future? The trend of doom spending is like a double-edged sword. On one hand, it provides temporary relief from stress, a fleeting sense of normalcy in a world that seems increasingly out of control. On the other, it's a path to potential financial ruin. Credit card debts are skyrocketing, savings are dwindling, and the concept of financial security is becoming more elusive. And let's talk about the irony here. This spending spree is happening at a time when, realistically, most people's excess savings have vanished into thin air. It's a stark contrast to the frugality one might expect in such times. Is this a sign of collective denial? A subconscious rebellion against the economic constraints tightening around us? Moreover, how does this align with the broader economic picture? Banks and financial institutions are closely monitoring this trend. If doom spending continues unchecked, could it lead to a more significant financial crisis? Are we, as a nation, setting ourselves up for a harder fall? These are questions that need urgent contemplation. The phenomenon of doom spending isn't just a quirky trend. It's a reflection of the deep-seated anxieties and uncertainties plaguing our society. The decisions we make today could very well shape the economic landscape of tomorrow. So I ask you, are we spending our way into a deeper crisis? Have you considered the sheer magnitude of the consumer debt that's been piling up? We're not just talking about a few extra dollars on credit cards. We're talking about a monumental surge, a spike in consumer borrowing that's more than just alarming. In November alone, borrowing spiked by an astounding $23.75 billion. This figure didn't just exceed expectations, it more than doubled the predictions of a $9 billion increase. What does this say about the financial habits and pressures facing the average American today? But here's where it gets even more concerning. This borrowing frenzy has pushed outstanding credit balances over the $5 trillion mark for the first time ever. Stop and think about that for a moment. $5 trillion. It's a number so large it's almost abstract, yet it represents a very real burden on countless individuals. Are consumers overextending themselves? What happens when the bills come due and the income isn't there to cover them? This debt isn't just a personal issue, it's a ticking time bomb for the broader economy. With credit card usage and buy now, pay later options skyrocketing, especially during the holiday season, we're seeing a pattern that's unsustainable. Delinquencies are now at their highest level since 2012. This isn't just a warning sign, it's a loud and clear signal that many Americans might be reaching their financial breaking point. Now, let's connect the dots to corporate profits. Companies have been riding high on elevated profit margins, a trend partly fueled by pandemic-era spending. But what happens when the well runs dry? If consumer spending plummets due to tapped-out credit lines and mounting debt, where does that leave these corporations? The logic is simple, yet stark reduced consumer spending leads to falling profits. And in a bid to preserve these profits, what measures might companies take? Layoffs, cost-cutting, reduced investments, the potential ripple effects are extensive and worrying. The situation poses some pressing questions. How will companies adapt to this potential decline in consumer spending? Will they be able to maintain their profit margins? Or will we see a wave of cost-cutting measures that could exacerbate the economic downturn? 
And most importantly, how will the average American navigate this tightening financial landscape? The recent data from the New York Factory Index is more than just a set of numbers. It's a distress signal. The index has plummeted to its lowest level since May 2020. This isn't a minor fluctuation or a seasonal adjustment. This is a stark indication of a contraction in the manufacturing sector, a sector that's a cornerstone of the U.S. economy. What does this mean for the countless workers whose livelihoods depend on this industry? But it's not just about the current state of affairs. This downturn in manufacturing is a harbinger of what's to come in the labor market. Think about it. Manufacturing slows down, new orders dry up, backlogs start to thin out. What's the next logical step for businesses? Unfortunately, it often means layoffs. If there's less work, fewer hands are needed on deck. This could lead to a rise in unemployment claims, a trend that, once started, can escalate quickly. Consider the implications of this. A rise in unemployment doesn't just affect those directly losing their jobs, it has a ripple effect across the economy. Less income means less spending, which in turn can lead to further reductions in manufacturing demand. It's a vicious cycle, one that can be incredibly challenging to break. And then there's the broader picture. If the manufacturing sector is indeed a canary in the coal mine for the labor market, what does this say about the overall health of the U.S. economy? Are we on the brink of a more significant downturn? How will this impact the average American family, the small business owner, the recent college graduate entering the workforce? You've probably heard about the jobless claims dropping to 187,000, the lowest since September 2022. On the surface, this sounds like great news, right? But hold on, there's more to this story. We're dealing with seasonally adjusted numbers here. The real question is, are these figures painting an accurate picture of our economy? Let's break it down. The initial claims decreased by 16,000 to 187,000 for the week ending January 13th. Look at New York, for instance, where claims fell over 177,000. But this is on an unadjusted basis. Now think about the continuing claims, the seasonally adjusted number, which is a proxy for the number of people receiving unemployment benefits, decreased for a third straight week to 1.81 million, the lowest since October. But can we take these seasonally adjusted numbers at face value? Here's where it gets intriguing. What if the real situation in the labor market is different? Consider the non-seasonally adjusted numbers. Last week, initial claims on a non-seasonally adjusted basis were up almost 19,000. This week, they dropped 29,000 to just about 289,000. That's a significant deviation, more than 100,000 more than the seasonally adjusted number. And remember those continued claims? On a non-seasonally adjusted basis, they actually went up 18,000 to 2.12 million people. The total number of Americans on various forms of unemployment is now up 200,000 to 2.13 million. What does this tell us about the real health of our job market? This discrepancy is a huge red flag. It suggests that maybe, just maybe, the labor market isn't as robust as we're being led to believe. And if that's the case, what does it mean for you, for your job, for your financial security? Now let's connect the dots to the Federal Reserve's actions. Bank of America's CEO, Brian Moynihan, is worried that the Fed's rate hikes could overshoot, leading to dire consequences for the labor market. Look at the past. In the 1970s, we saw periods where the Fed was raising rates while initial claims were rising, almost moving together with just a slight lag. But things changed in the mid to late 80s. When the Fed hiked rates, the market didn't respond with layoffs immediately. However, when the Fed went too far, as Moynihan fears might happen again, it led to an increase in initial claims and a big decrease in the federal fund rate. In the realm of real estate and mortgages, there's a looming concern that's hard to ignore. The CEO of Bank of America has raised a red flag about the impact of rate hikes on the mortgage market. Now. Think about it. When bank rates increase, what happens to the demand for loans? It plummets. And this isn't just a theoretical worry. We're already seeing signs of this downturn. Demand is very low, and it's not just a blip on the radar. This is a trend that's unfolding right before our eyes. But here's where it gets even more intriguing. Despite the decline in housing starts, building permits are on the rise. What does this mean? Builders are still optimistic, or perhaps overly so. They're continuing to plan new constructions, 
with permits increasing to a 1.5 million pace. Applications for single-family homes have surged to the strongest pace since May 2022. But is this optimism misplaced? If the demand for loans is falling, and yet building continues, aren't we heading towards a potential oversupply in the housing market? And what happens when supply outstrips demand? Prices typically fall. This could lead to a scenario where builders, sitting on unsold inventory, might start slashing prices. Could this trigger a downward spiral in the real estate market? With higher mortgage rates, can people afford these new homes? There's a real question about the sustainability of the housing market under these conditions. And if consumers start to pull back, feeling the pinch of higher rates, the impact could ripple through the entire economy. But there's another angle to this, the banks themselves. They're the ones lending for these mortgages and construction projects. If the real estate market takes a hit, what does that mean for the banks? Remember, a significant portion of a bank's loan portfolio is often tied up in real estate. If defaults increase and property values decrease, banks could find themselves in a precarious position. This could lead to tighter lending standards, further choking off the supply of credit to potential home buyers and builders. When a banking giant like Bank of America starts talking about tightening belts, it's not just corporate speak. It's a reflection of the broader economic landscape that could soon impact your wallet. Moynihan's advice is straightforward yet profound. Start paying down on your debt and building up your savings. But why this sense of urgency? With the Federal Reserve's rate hikes, the cost of borrowing is going up. This isn't just about big corporations. It affects the interest rates on your credit cards, your mortgage, your car loans. Higher interest rates mean higher monthly payments. So ask yourself, are you prepared for this increase in your financial obligations? And then there's the job market. Yes, we've seen some positive signs like the plunge in jobless claims to 187,000. But let's not forget, these are seasonally adjusted numbers. What happens when the seasonal work dries up? What if the real, unadjusted numbers start reflecting a different, more concerning story? If job security starts to wobble, how will that impact your ability to keep up with your financial commitments? Moynihan's warning about delinquencies turning into defaults isn't just a cautionary tale for the banking industry. It's a potential reality for many Americans. If people start defaulting on their loans, it's not just a problem for the banks. It's a problem for the entire economy. And when the economy suffers, no one is immune. Could your job be on the line if companies start feeling the pinch? Could your investments take a hit? This is why Moynihan's advice about paying down debt is so critical. In a time when economic indicators are fluctuating, carrying less debt is not just smart. It's a shield against uncertainty. And what about savings? In an ideal world, we'd all have a substantial nest egg to fall back on. But let's be real. Many Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. So the question is, how do you start saving when it feels like every dollar is already accounted for? The answer lies in re-evaluating your financial priorities. It's about making tough choices now to avoid tougher situations later. Can you cut back on some of your discretionary spending? Can you find ways to increase your income, even marginally? Every little bit you save now could be a lifeline in a more challenging economic environment. And let's not forget the housing market. If you're a homeowner or planning to buy a house, how will this affect you? Are you ready for a potential increase in your mortgage payments? And if the housing market takes a hit, what does that mean for your home's value? At a recent economic forum, there was serious talk about a new health crisis, termed Apple X. Now, this isn't your typical health scare. We're talking about something that, according to descriptions, could turn people into what resembles zombies. Yes, you heard that right. It's as if we're living in an episode of The Last of Us, or The Walking Dead. But how real could this be? And more importantly, are we prepared for such an unprecedented event? This discussion isn't just a trivial matter. Remember, historically, when these forums discuss potential crises, things tend to materialize in one form or another. It's not just about the health scare itself, it's about the ripple effects. Think about it. What does this mean for our emergency services, our healthcare system, and our day-to-day -day life? In response to these growing concerns, we're seeing a surge in emergency preparedness. People are stocking up on long shelf-life food supplies. We're talking about products with a 25-year shelf-life. That's a quarter of a century. And it's not just food. 
there's a growing interest in self-powered heating solutions. Imagine a scenario where the power grid fails. How would you keep warm? How would you cook your food? With the economy already in a precarious state, how would an event like this impact our financial stability? Are our savings and investments safe? What about the job market? If people are too scared to go out, what happens to businesses, both big and small? Now, I know this all sounds like something out of a dystopian novel, but the conversations at these high-level forums are real. They're discussing these scenarios for a reason. In these rapidly changing times, we're seeing something quite extraordinary unfold across the United States and beyond. Have you noticed the shift? Cities like Long Beach and California are now experimenting with guaranteed income programs. They're giving away over a million dollars in free money to families struggling below the poverty line. It's a bold move, one that raises as many questions as it answers. How will this impact the economy in the long run? Is this a sustainable solution or a temporary band-aid on a much larger wound? And it's not just happening here. Look north to Canada, where the government is seriously considering a nationwide universal basic income, UBI. The idea is to provide a livable income to everyone over 17. But let's think about this for a moment. Where is all this money coming from? They say it's free, but we all know nothing is truly free. Is it going to be funded by taxpayers, or will it lead to more money printing, potentially fueling inflation? This isn't just an economic issue, it's a societal one. We're venturing into uncharted territory. If governments start providing basic income, what does that mean for the future of work? Will it discourage productivity? Or will it provide a much-needed safety net for those in need? And what about the psychological effects? There's a certain dignity in work, a sense of purpose. Are we ready to redefine what work means in our society? But let's not forget the backdrop against which all this is happening. We're still reeling from the economic impacts of recent global events. People are struggling. And these measures, like UBI, are responses to very real and immediate needs. The question is, are they the right responses? And then there's the issue of affordability. Housing has become a distant dream for many. In Maine, for instance, a state of emergency was declared due to severe weather, exacerbating the housing crisis. Insurance premiums are skyrocketing, making it even harder for the average American to own a home. It's a vicious cycle. As natural disasters worsen, so do the costs of living. We're also seeing a shift in how governments are handling non-citizens. In New York City, for example, Schools are being repurposed to house non-citizens, pushing local students to e-learning. This is a significant change in policy, one that could have far-reaching implications. How will this affect the quality of education for our children? And what does it mean for the future of immigration policy? Thank you for watching.